Greetings and welcome to Maisha Kazini. Today we are honored to have Dr. Jamima Pierre with us, who is going to talk to us about uh, different global events in relation to Haiti. And Dr. Pierre is a professor of global race in the Institute of Race, Gender, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia. And she's also a research associate at the Center for the Study of Race, Gender, and Class at the University of Johannesburg. She's also the author of a fabulous book that I am still reading entitled The Predicament of Blackness, Postcolonial Ghana and the Politics of Race. And she has also authored Race, and Africa Cultural and Historical Legacies. She's also a member of the Black Alliance for Peace and she writes for the Black Agenda Report. So welcome, Dr. Pierre. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. So good to be here. Um, so I, I want to start with this, your fascinating book about Ghana. Maybe we could just start with a biography of how did you come to, to talking about race in Ghana? Yes, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a funny story. I um I actually was doing I I'm from I was born in Haiti and grew up in the U.S. Um, um from when I was about eight years old, and um, so I grew up as a black immigrant in the U.S. and um, with all of that terrible you know terrible things that came with that, especially um, in Miami, Florida, um, where I grew up. And when I started graduate school, I wanted to, I started studying black immigrants in the US and I had lived in Ghana before as a, a undergraduate student. And I travel, actually I've been to Kenya, I've been all over Kenya. Um, oh, okay. I have, um, I'm dating myself, but this was like in the nineties, I was, you know, I was in Kenya. Um, and, um, and so, you know, living there for, you know, dealing with all kinds of things. And then when I uh, started graduate school, I wanted to do African immigrants in the U.S. and thinking about how they're experiencing the U.S. Um, compared to African-Americans, those in the diaspora who've been there a long time. And, and people kept telling me, well, you know, I didn't know I was black until I came to the U.S. And I kept thinking, what does that mean? <laughs> and what I did I like <laughs> Yeah, yeah and I've heard that line, you know, that line comes over. It's just like, well, I'm a black immigrant. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, Nigerian. And I didn't think about being black until I was in the U.S. And so I said, okay, this is not what I remember, you know, having lived um, mm -hmm. um, in, in Ghana and having had very specific experiences, especially with the differential treatment of white people in mm -hmm. Africa compared to myself. And, and so I said, okay, well, I'm going to, go and see if there's no such thing as blackness or race in Ghana. So, and so I, I took that and, and I moved back to Ghana and, um, and, and, and basically lived there for about a year and a half and, and added that to my own experiences, wrote this, uh, and then kept going back and then did a lot of archival research and found out a lot of stuff about Ghana. And one of the key, uh, and, and, and Ghana and the whole African continent, but because this was a case study, I focused on Ghana, but this thing has resonance all over. And one of the key things that emerged for me is, a, uh, is, an, is, is an idea that I read in actually Mahmoud Mamdani, I know a controversial scholar, um, yeah. uh, his book, Citizen and Subject, where he says apartheid was actually the basic, was the, the normal mode of colonialism throughout everywhere, and, and, and you know, not just in South Africa. And so I was like, this is interesting. And, and so sure enough, in the in the archives, you would see, you know, there were colonial cities where you had the white sections, the native sections, the white hospitals. And I even found an archive where the British tried to actually change the name of the hospital towards the end at, after World War II. It was like, okay, we're gonna send a directive to, from Downing Street saying, we're gonna remove European from the European, the name European hospital. So they knew exactly what they were doing. There's stuff in the archives about how to name these natives. They, you know, we can't, they can't be the same. We can't call them cheat. We can't call kings kings because there's only one king, the king of England, you know, things like that. So it's just really fascinating finding this stuff and then seeing how then, you know, knowing both the history of slavery and seeing how colonialism worked and then seeing how mm -hmm. race is very key to the construction of, of, mm -hmm. of the way that Europeans think about us, but the construction of how we then end up accepting our identity. So that's, so then, you know, I proved that wrong, that the idea you didn't think you, they do think they're black because the truth is if me and a white man are standing, is standing in line at a bank, you know, um, in, in, in Ghana, and I could be dressed up, the man could be in a 
dirty shorts and t-shirt, he'll get better service than I am. And and that's the than I would. And that's the reality. And so we know yeah, who's black and yeah. who isn't. Mm, and and that, that happens too in Kenya. Um, so there's something interesting I heard you say in one of your many uh, talks that uh, that that colonialism started with slavery and so did the concept of race. So I wanted us to go back uh, in time because Ghana did not, I mean, the first time race was in Ghana was not during colonialism. It was during the slave trade. So what was uh, what was the concept of race uh, in during the the Middle Passage? And, and in what way did it evolve both in the continent and, and in the Americas? Yeah, and what's important to know about race is that it's not something that goes back to time immemorial, right? So this idea, there's always been ideas of difference, right? Difference around language, religion, and so on. But the modern concept of race emerges through the slave, through the trade in Africans. And 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 it 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 didn't, it didn't, it's not, you know, um one the famous quote by who is it? Um Eric Williams that says it was slavery that allowed the construction of race. It was slavery and um, because what it is, is you conquer a group of people, you start enslaving them and selling them, and then you create this justification for that action, right? Mm. And so, so in that order, so it's not that there was like anti-blackness from time immemorial because people, the world has always been, people mixed and so on and so forth, but this concept of race where it sticks, where blackness always already means certain things, I think, you know, the modern part emerges from the slave trade, where you start trading in Africans, you have all these groups of people, you bring people together, you buy them, and then you transfer them to a new world. And so all their differentiations in are flattened. So the Igbos, the Wolofs, the Akans, put together on the, on, 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 on the ship, brought to the U.S., and then are now, be, they all become Black. Mm -hmm. Right. So they've all been flattened into And then you have to basically say they're Black, and then there's an, and, and, and you, you make, you, they're working on the fields and in the US and the Americas in particular, you bring in, you know, when when slave men, when in, when slavery began, they first tried it with Native Americans, right? The the indigenous populations here. In yeah. fact, you know, they even shipped some Native Americans to the West Coast of Africa to work on plantations, right? And people don't realize that, right? And so so they start with Native Americans. Uh, a lot of them would run away because they knew the land, they would die off. A lot of, you know, they decimated the Native American populations. This is what Europeans do. <laughs> These are the biggest gangsters in the world. Let me just say that, <laughs> right, right, the Europeans, let's remember that. And so this is what they did. They decimated the Native, um, um, the native population. And so then they brought in, they had white um, indentured servants, but right? they had five years, seven year periods, you know, the poor from Europe to come and work the fields because they're stealing land from the indigenous people and they need to work the land, but they don't have the, you know, they need the labor for the land. So finally, they start bringing Africans because they're already a trade. There's Trans-Saharan slave trade, right, and 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 Indian Ocean slave trade. Start bringing Africans, but Africans look distinct. They're not from that land, so they can't necessarily run away. After a while, they write laws to say slavery is in perpetuity and for your family. So there's a lot of ways where they basically consolidate slavery as something that's just about people from Africa. And so mm -hmm. Africans become enslaved. And then now you have to say, well, these are human beings, right? So mm -hmm. how can you say you're a Christian and you're enslaving human beings? Well, you come up with racial science, which is the emergence of physical anthropology, right? That basically says that, you know, these people are not even the same species. So there were two, two groups, one of them like the, mono, the monogenous people who believed like in one God, one human group, and then people believed in one God and multiple species. Right, so that so there are people who are saying Africans were actually not even the same species as other groups, right? That they were like different species and they're not really part of the same human race. There's some people that say, well, we're part of the same human race, but some of you know they're just backwards and they're just like they're like children that haven't you know made it yet. So you have you have an intellectual apparatus that actually used to buttress the actual material realities of enslavement on the ground. So mm -hmm. this is happening in the 1700s, the 1800s. So by the time you know, by the time you have actual conquests, you know, after 1885, when the Europeans got together in Berlin and decided to partition the um, the, the African continent, by this time you already have missionaries, right, um, on the ground. Also, you know, 
Christianity was part of enslavement, right? They used the Bible to justify slavery. Mm -hmm. So by the time they go back to colonize the African continent, right? Ideas about racial difference, ideas about black inferiority has already been set and that's been global. So even in places that didn't part, that didn't have that didn't have people enslaved that didn't participate uh, in 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 the trade um completely, they're all they're all um they all become victims to this racialization of, of equating black people, Africans with inferiority, um, mm -hmm. both cultural inferiority and intellectual inferiority, and as only being seen a, a particular way. And so this is this is this is what we're seeing in terms of thinking about it. So, by, so colonialism is not where ideas of race started. Colonialism is a consolidation of ideas of race in terms of taking over African land. Um, in, 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 and then and then ruling people, so-called pacifying the population to get them to accept their their colonization. That's really important because I saw a Kenyan saying that uh, oh, uh, um, slavery doesn't concern me because my ethnic group was not uh, enslaved, so that that has nothing to do with my concern about colonialism. But it's actually you're saying the ideas about race justified. Uh, the colonial project. Right. Slavery, you know, allowed the emergence of the modern notion of race, which, yes. but slavery also funded the colonial project because without the slave trade, mm -hmm. you would not have the industrial revolution. And I, and I urge everyone to read Eric Williams' book, Capitalism and Slavery. Without yes. slavery, you will not have the development of capitalism and the industrial revolution in Europe that then gives them the tools right? It's slavery that actually helped shipbuilding, helped navigation skills, because they had to keep getting better at transporting Africans, the millions and millions and millions of Africans they brought over. Mm -hmm. And then it's it's slavery that actually allowed insurance policy, you know, the insurance um, companies, because they had to insure their property, right? It is, it is slavery that allowed the emergence of banking and particular kinds of banking and trading and so on and so forth. So it's slavery that really gave a push to the, the rise of capitalism and that led to the industrial revolution that then allowed the Europeans to become manufacturers to actually come up now with medicines navigation skills so that they can actually enter the African continent because before they were stuck on the on the coast they were dying like drills trying to get inside inland right yes, and so yeah. it, it, it is you know, it is the the boom, the money, free labor from the slave trade that makes their industries grow. Then that then gives them the power to come back. Then they construct the gun, the, the Maxim gun, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the, the first automatic gun that can shoot down people. It allows them the medicines then that, that they create that then, you know, quinine, that they that then allows them to actually survive malaria so they go inland. It is it is slavery that gives them all the basis, that gives them the foundation to actually be able to go in and colonize the African continent. Mm. So we have to remember that. But it's also slavery that gives them the idea that Africans are less than. Because if it was, if they didn't have these ideas, the way that they go in, I mean, the what, what King Leopold did to Congo, right? And people don't talk about that, right? King yeah. Leopold killed what? 10 million, More than 10 million, 20 million Congolese and yeah. got away with it, right? Yeah. And then the German, I bet you most people don't know, for example, the first um, uh, 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 first genocide of the 20th century is Namibia. Germany's Second Reich in Namibia, the Herero yeah. Namako people, right? Mm -hmm. This is 1908, right? So this is before Hitler. If African lives mattered, Leopold would be more reviled than Hitler. We have to be clear about this, right? And so yeah. it is, you know, the reality is that by the time they get to the African continent, the ideas around black people, I don't care if your family was not enslaved or your ethnic group, the idea of an ethnic group is constructed and reconstructed according to European needs, right? Yeah. So we have to remember that. So uh, can we go to Haiti now? Um, maybe you can tell us what was the position of Haiti in the whole slave economy and uh, how did the revolution emerge? It's a long question. And what did that revolution do to um, to the whole, uh, what you're calling the intellectual apparatus of 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 race and black people? That, that's I'm glad you're asking this. I just taught this in my class last week, so <laughs> it's, it's fresh. But you know, um, so uh, 
the first place that um, Christopher Columbus, you know, the first, uh, the person that supposedly discovered um, um, America was Hispaniola, the island, which is now Haiti, that there's two countries in it. So that's the first place. Haiti is central to the modern world because this is the first place um, the Europeans landed when they tried to conquer the Americas. They landed there and then there was a fight. Yes, so Hispaniola is where Christopher Columbus first landed. They decimated, they killed the Taino people, the indigenous folks on the land. Um, and, and then later on, the French and the Spanish fought and decided to split the island. So the French took the left part of the island, and then the Spanish took the, the eastern, you know, the, the west, the French took the west, the Spanish took the east. Haiti, which was called Saint Domingue, was French's colony, was the richest colony in during slavery. It provided half of the world's coffee. It provided, I think, more than a quarter of 40% of the world's sugar. It was called the Pearl of the Antilles by the French. It mm -hmm. was their biggest money maker. And, and the reason, and but the other reason, the reason was that was the case was that slavery there was absolutely brutal. The lifespan of the average African that was brought in was five to seven years, which meant that from five years from the moment you landed to the moment you died, right? Because they were, they, it was cheaper for them to keep importing Africans than it was to actually treat them good enough, well yeah. enough for them to actually live long and have children and reproduce. And that's a very different uh, model than the US model where they depended on a domestic production, they were um, replicating. So people had children and the children became enslaved. So this was most of the, most of the enslaved population in the US were actually, you know, they were like Creole, right? They were born in the US and so on and so forth. Unlike the Caribbean and even parts of Latin America, I bet you people don't know, for example, the US had the least amount of enslaved Africans. It was actually Brazil, Haiti and, and places like that. So anyway, so Haiti, Saint-Domingue, it was called Saint-Domingue at the time, it's French is the most, um, 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 uh, the richest colony is making Haiti very rich. At the time, then you had, you know, at the time of the revolution. And the other thing is, Africans have always resisted. So they were always resisting before they got on the boat, got there. They're always, um, you know, their po population that would go resist and run hide into the mountains and never come back. And some of them would have to, and then they would fight guerrilla war against the, the the colonial masters, and then the colonial masters would have to actually would actually sign a deal with them to leave them alone. So you had that, but at the beginning of the Haitian Re Revolution, what you have is a population that was five hundred thousand Africans, most of them born on the African continent, about thirty thousand French, and thirty thousand mixed race people or free blacks. Those a few that were able to buy the, their their um, their their um, their um, freedom. This is also distinct from the US. This is how race is always made up because in the US, if you have one black parent, they call you black. Even if you have like black blood from like great, great grandparent, they'll call. So that's how they increase their enslaved population. So they made mixed race people, they turn them all black, right? They're like, you're black. So you, yeah. they increase. Whereas in the Caribbean, they mixed race people in some parts of it, right? It's, they, were, they were allowed to be free. Right, especially in this is mixed race people, you know, resulting of rape of African women by the enslavers, right? Um, yeah. But in the Caribbean, some of them owned slaves themselves, right? And they owned the wealth of their fathers. So the population was 500,000 Africans, 30,000 whites, and 30,000 free people mm -hmm. colored. The French Revolution happens. And the French people, the col colonists, the, you know, they're like, mad at the French Revolution because they want their own rights. They want to do like the US did, right? Pull away from the colonies. So this is happening. The mixed race population saw themselves as French. So they wanted, they're like, well, if this revolution has happened, we want our rights. We want to be equal to the rights. We don't want to be second tier. They also did not like the Africans. Mm. The revolution, they go, they send a delegation to France during this revolution, it's happening, you know, they kill the king and all of this stuff. They refuse to recognize them, give them full rights, right? So they, they come back and they're, they're mad. So then they decide to join because this is the time they decide to. So they're Wait, trying to fight. Yeah. So sorry. So you're saying the the mixed race went to France to take part in the the French Revolution. To, to, to advocate for their rights to not be second class citizens. 
Uh huh. Well, were they hoping to be like, are you, are, are, are you get the same rights as America? the whites, right? To not be discriminated against. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Uh huh. Yeah. And so, but they were rebuffed, right? Yes. And so, you know, it's, it's really interesting because all these things had to come together. They weren't rebuffed. We don't know what could have happened. Right. But at the mm -hmm. same time, all this is happening. They're talking about, you know, rights of man and this and that. These friends, you know, this, despite the fact that they're all enslavers. Right. But they're talking about, you know, revolution and li liberté, égalité, fraternité and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And meanwhile, the Africans are like, OK, this is the time we strike. So the Africans start rebelling. And, and so they did not even you know, the rest of them are fighting for this and Africans were like, well, we want liberty as well. And so the revolution begins in 1791, where they turn and they must have, you know, you know, they had a ceremony, uh, a, a, a voodoo ceremony that led, you know, and then all the farms got together, they burned down, they killed their masters, burned down the plantations, and it was war. And it was a guerrilla war for 13 years, right? Wow. And, and then when Napoleon becomes Napoleon Bonaparte, the Napoleon Bonaparte at the time had the most powerful military in the world. Um, at first, French tried, the, the French Revolution, the folks of the revolution tried to give in. And then they're like, OK, well, fine. What do you want? They're like, we want the end of slavery. So they they tried. So they said, OK, we're going to remove slavery from the, the rest um, um, for all the French French speaking islands. But then they, um, but then Napoleon decided, no, this is not going to happen. Mind you, the Haitians are fighting against the British because once the British see the Haitians are, 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 are um, revolting, they pull in, try to steal France's land, right? So then they fought the British. Then they end up fighting the Spanish. They fought the, the, the Americans. So at the end of the day, when uh, Napoleon is like, okay, this cannot happen, 1801, 1802, he sends an armada of like, 40 to 50,000 military soldiers and show up at the island to take back the island. That's a ship? Right. Okay. <laughs> Ships, yeah. Um, but yeah, with, with what, 40,000, 50,000 soldiers to take over the island. Mm -hmm. And they he loses two thirds of his soldiers. And, and it's, this was the most powerful army in the world. Mm -hmm. He loses all. So a lot of them, you know, people like it was sick. None, it was sickness. Of course, there's malaria and so on and so forth. But this is also Haitians fighting back because at this time they're armed, right? Um, and if you go to Haiti in the citadel in the top of the mountains, there's a there's a citadel, a huge a fortress that the Haitians built, and inside you can see all the cannons that they got from the different European powers during the revolution, like from the French, from the Spanish, from the English, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So. At the end of, at, you know, so the, they, it, they routed, it was a scorch earth policy. They defeated the French. Napoleon leaves. So they retreat. And in retreating, Napoleon sold this huge territory that it had in North America called the Louisiana Territory before yeah. the US only had the Eastern side. Napoleon sold that. So after losing Haiti, Napoleon gave up the dream of having an empire in the Western Hemisphere and mm. sold the Louisiana territory for $9 million, which was very cheap, which is which tripled the size of the US overnight. Mm. So because of the Haitian Revolution, the US got bigger and, and, and France lost out. But at the same time, what the Haitians did in 1804 when they declared victory, you know, they said they got rid of slavery, they got rid of colonialism, and the constitution said, no white man shall ever come back to this country to own land. And, and, and rule over us. So that was on in the constitution that no white foreigners can own land in Haiti, right? Mm -hmm. And then they call the nation, they call the country Haiti uh, based on the original indigenous name, IET, right? So the Haitian revolution was caused, a, you know, it's funny, people learn about the American revolution, the, the, the French revolution, not the Haitian revolution, but the Haitian mm -hmm. revolution actually transformed the world because it's the first modern nation that was built um, on the basis of non-racism, no colonialism, and, and none of that. So it was like, this is a true nation rights of man. Remember, this is 1804, there's still slavery in the US. There's still slavery all throughout the Caribbean and Latin America, right? So, yeah. and because of that, it's the first modern nation, second independent nation in the hemisphere after the US. Yeah. So Haiti's almost as old as the US, right? Yeah. Um, 
And so, and then basically it, it made, it destroyed notions of white superiority and white and, and, and idea that whiteness is inevitable. Whiteness is greatness and black inferiority is, you know, is forever. And, mm. and, and I think it, that's, that's key because what happens is, is that Haitians have been paying for that <laughs> ever since, because after the Haitian revolution, there are all kinds of, you know, revolts all over and they were completely afraid. So if you read old texts, they'll say like, we don't want another saint -Domingue. We don't want another saint -Domingue. We don't want what happened to Haiti to happen in our colony. So then it actually made life worse for the other populations that were enslaved in the Caribbean and Latin America. But the other mm -hmm. thing is, Haiti was embargoed, right? Because it was by itself. They're in this scorched earth. They had to burn down everything. So here they are. The U.S. did not, nobody recognized them. So there's this land of formerly enslaved Africans who had to kill everything to win. And then now no one wants to, you know, because the Europeans run the world, no one will trade with them, mm -hmm. right? And then at the same time, they're being challenged. Every few years, the French would send a bunch of ships tried to shoot him up. And so at the in, at the end, you had one of these mulatto, leader, mulatto leaders, mixed race leaders in South Haiti, where they decided then to enter in a deal with France in 1825 to get recognition so they can have some trading. France said the only way we'll give you recognition if you pay us back for the lost property, which means that the Africans had to pay the French for their freedom. Yeah. And, and, the, and, and But then the French did that by showing up surrounding the island with gunboats mm. right and at this time these people are tired they're hungry mm -hmm. and, and they're tired of fighting and so mm -hmm. he says okay and so they had to pay uh, uh france back the equivalent of today i think it's like 25 something billion dollars right in gold mm -hmm. in fact they couldn't pay they had to take a loan from france to pay france back and they did not finish paying this till 1947 mm -hmm. 120 something years later Mm -hmm. So if you know, want to know the history of Haiti, this is it. The U.S. did not recognize Haiti till 1862, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so on. Yeah. So what what did what did that mean in terms of the kind of ideas about race and specifically about Haiti that the Western powers were determined to spread? You know. What was it that they were doing to Haiti after 1865? You know, how how does that fit in the logic of race? Oh well, yeah. The way that the Europeans represented the the revolution was that a bunch of savages were going out there killing our whites, mm. right? Killing mm. our rights and leaving our, our our women, right? I mean, because that's the narrative, right? Especially you know, if it's happening in like in a black country or brown country or Muslim country, it's like they're killing our whites, they're killing our women, and they're raping our women. So the the representation of the Haitian Revolution in the Western press was horrendous. It mm. was like these savages, you know, they had these pictures of like you know monsters looking blacks eating whites and you know stuff like that so if you read like even the new york times right the you know from like the late 1800 the representation is the same so everybody has this idea that the haitians went a rampage raped all the white women killed all the killed all the men which is actually not true the fascinating part though is like if we represented the brutality of slavery the way that they talked about this revolution you'd be because what kind of system where somebody can only live five years because they work them to death? Not mm. the, or the fact that you have a huge mixed race population because the women are being raped. Mm -hmm. So the brutality of slavery gets lost, right? Yeah. So what they focus yeah. on is the revolution. And then yeah. they, so Haitians, you know, down to like when the US, and then the US occupied Haiti from 1915 to 1934, Citibank went into Haiti with the help of the US Marines, took $500,000 worth of gold out of Haiti's bank, put it on a boat and shipped it to New York. Right. And so, and so what's fascinating is just like, it's been this kind of story of looting from the West um, from the very yes. beginning. But in terms of race, the representations of Haitians yeah. from before, but after, uh, especially after the, uh, the, the, the revolution is one of savages. And, mm. then, and then they've been, um, and because Haiti has always been, you know, the French, you know, try to take control and then the U.S. occupied Haiti and the U.S. has been in charge, taking control of Haiti from from then. Right. Just, mm -hmm. You know, people resist all the time, but the U.S. has done this. And then it's about the story of like these people who can't govern themselves, 
who need help, yes. you know, and yes. if you don't, yes. if you don't do something about them, they're going to divulge, go back to the savagery and with savagery. And if you read some of these things, it's like, they're like modern institutions don't fit these people. Their savagery is like the savagery of Africans, because that's how they thought about Africa as well. Right. So, yeah. so Haiti, even within the Caribbean is seen as like too African to be modern. Like Haiti is like the African wanted, country of the Caribbean. I wanted to go to that because you mentioned that the Haitians, many of them were were born in Africa. So did that conception of race stick partly because most of the people had just come directly from the continent? Any link to Africa and blackness is always a link to stereotypes mm -hmm. of savage, whatever. Even now, it's it's fascinating. Yeah. You know, when Ebola, you know, when Ebola uh uh exploded in west africa back in like 2018 2017 2018 the cover of the the papers here were like a monkey a chimpanzee right because it's just like did the africans get it through interactions with the monkeys you remember all the stereotypes around aids they were saying mm -hmm. africans were having sex with monkeys mm -hmm. right so the mm -hmm. stereotypes about africans it's not just about haiti then that's why i want kenyans to know Yes, you might think you're Kenyan, or you might think you're Kikuyu, Kikuyu, or Luo. To to the rest of the white world, we are black and we are savages. The whole Look, lot of us. When, yes, when when there's a quote, and I have to find it. And I'll email it to you. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan, they released his secret phone calls when during a, a independent celebration from something, and he said, and he's talking on the phone. He's like, yeah, I just saw the most amazing thing it's just like you know these monkeys it looks like a bunch of, it's talking about african leaders right you know he's like it's like these monkeys just learned they're still not used to wearing shoes this is ronald reagan u.s president on a private call with his buddy a recorded call so people we have to know you know that we are we have distinctions but the views about blackness and black people and africans remain and it, they follow us despite the fact that slavery ended almost 200 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go to, I go to Telegram and I'm watching, you know, I read news and stuff like that. Anytime there's an African thing represented, people will put, people put banana, banana emojis, right? But look at how they treat African players in Europe. Mm -hmm. Look at the monkey yeah. champs. Yeah. In Eastern Europe mm -hmm. in particular, look how Ukraine treated Africans mm -hmm. at the beginning of the war. So we cannot be, naive yes to not understand the way that race and anti-blackness plays in the way which is why africa is at the bottom of every single you know global hierarchy right mm -hmm. so. so the the i heard you talking about the way uh even african can african countries and caribbean countries got sort of imbibed the the same ideas about Haiti. Around when was this happening and what were the, were, were the dynamics of that? That that really shocked me and saddened me, but it's something we need to talk about. So how, well, I, how is it that Haiti got this bad rap among fellow Caribbeans and also African countries? Right, but we have to think about the, the, the fact that our, our governments from right at independence are, became neo-colonial governments. And I think, you know, you had radical leaders who were killed or deposed, and then everyone, everything else, everyone else that replaced them are not. So we used to have like people from like Walter Rodney, CLR James, all these people from the yeah. Caribbean, right? Yeah. You don't have those. What you have are neo-colonial replacements that yeah. are amenable to, West, to the West. But the views around Haiti goes back a long time because if you think about it, the, the US occupied Haiti and the images, if during the occupation, the US, there was a resistance movement to occupation, which is a 19 year occupation, which was brutal. It, it, it enforced um, forced labor to do, to build stuff. And it was like, you know, the US still had Jim Crow, which is apartheid racism. So they sent the soldiers from the South to occupy Haiti from 1915 to 1934. There's so much racism. And, you know, do you know that Haiti is the first place where the US dropped bombs from the air onto villages? Who were, who were fighting against um, um, the occupation. This is the first time the US used aerial bombardment. Mm -hmm. So we're the, you know, we're the experiment, right? Fighting yeah. against occupation, a racist occupation. But I think there's a combination of 
you know, religion, language, mm -hmm. race, um, education, right? Mm -hmm. So Haitians have seen it, so Africans, and our Vodou, the Vodou religion, which is one of many, is seen as savage and too African. And so people always use it as a way to say these people are like these savages. There's, you know, they're doing these African traditional religion and, and they speak this weird language, which is a Creole, which is um, not, most people don't speak it. And then the Francophone, the former French colonies in the Caribbean never chose not to take independence. So they're yeah. all still colonies of France. I mean, they don't want to call themselves colonies, but that's what they are, right? Yeah. And they speak French, right? <laughs> French, mm -hmm. we speak Creole, they speak French, right? So there's a way that black folks have learned, have believed everything they hear about Haiti. Because mm -hmm. look, who teaches you? If you think about the, the education system, I know for a fact that Kenya's um, history books are outsourced, written by this company that's, not, you know, a lot of them, but not even in, 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 in the US, I mean, in Kenya. I know yeah. this for a fact that Ghana, for example, they're still writing books about the positives and negatives of colonialism. That's what people that's are learning. That's crazy. Mm. Besides that, and then, you know, and I know Haiti got into, you know, Haiti, Haiti has had the bad rap from the very beginning in terms of around, especially if you have religious people, you know, the Vatican has a very terrible view of Haiti. Like when I was doing my research, you know, you read Ricky Leakes papers and the Vatican's like this, you know, uh, Aristide, which was the most popular president of Haiti is just like, well, he's not really a Catholic. He's like a voodoo priest and so on and so forth. And then you have Pat Robinson after the earthquake, yeah. mm. blamed the Haitians for their satanic practices for yes. the earthquake. And people mm. believe that. I'm like, if white people are such gods, is this the kind of God you want? The God that can go mm. around and kill everybody? Mm. What kind of God is it that tells you you need to drop bombs on Gaza and kill 4,000 babies? What kind of God tells you that you can go and drop a, an atomic bomb in Japan and kill 200,000 people in once? What kind of God tells you that it's okay to like kill a million Iraqis because you think they had weapons of mass destruction. What kind of God is that? That's not the kind of God I want. Mm -hmm. That allows God, if, if this is that kind of vengeful God, are you saying so only Haitians are 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 are, are bad enough because of the of a religion that they deserve an earthquake that kills two hundred thousand people? But Americans have been killing people how many years? How many millions of people? But they don't get anything. And that God is a fair God. I mean, we have to actually really think about these things. Look. I know my Bible. My father is a minister, so I actually know my Bible very well, <laughs> right? And I grew up in the church. And but we have to actually know the history of Christianity and the role of Christianity in constructing these ideas about blackness yeah. and black people and African savagery, because the missionaries actually were first before the colonialists came. And it's the missionaries we have to remember that also helped in creating ethnic identities. Because you know why? When you you know you know why they call um, translation reduction. You know, you know I when you for the first time from you that they called translation reduction of language. You're reducing the language. The wow. missionaries get there. There are yes. all kinds of different languages happening, and they're like, "Well, we need to standardize so yes. that we can understand, so that we can teach God." So what do they do? They mm. they narrow the language, which means yes. that they leave out so much. You lose language. And in narrowing the language, they create ethnic identity because they tell you, you know, this is what your language is. Oh my God, I had not said that. And, and you know, in some places in Kenya, there was there were certain languages that were standardized and imposed on other areas of Kenya. And it exactly. created so much bitterness. Yeah, exactly it's still there actually. and so you have a, a beauty of like different people different languages different people interacting over centuries before colonialism mm -hmm. and all yeah. of a sudden we're like and then look ethnicities were not closed groups yes. they were always transforming yeah. people yeah. were mixing moving and so on and so forth now all of a sudden we're all we're all luo and we've always been luo we've all kikuyu we've always been kikuyu and we're like this no you were changing colonialism stopped the transfer of cultures and languages and so on, it froze us. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, we'll come, now we come to, that was the point that I just found so difficult emotionally to, to grapple with. Um, how, how did, uh, what's the interaction between colonialism and ethnicity? And I don't know if you could comment on this thing that Terence Ranger wrote about the invention of tradition. Um, I, yeah, just, just break it down. What what was that? Well, I mean, you know, the, the reality is um, it, colonialism was very much part of the idea of constructing ethnicities in order to control, right? It's like, it's perfect yeah. divided rule. And Terrace Ranger, I mean, he became famous for that, the invention of tradition is that everything that people are like, oh, this is traditional, we've always done this. He's like, no, some of these things were invented. And, you know, the, you know, what's off mine, I think I was telling you this before we started recording is, I just taught this uh, 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 article on um, um, colonization and the constructing of race in India, and how the, 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 the British decided to split you know, had these stereotypes of like the Aryan race. And so the Hindus were linked to that. And then the martial race, which is like the Sikhs. And then they're saying that before the before the, the, the British invented the martial race, these people were living together. So it was like they're in the same areas, living together, intermarrying. And then they decided, they told the Sikhs that you guys are the martial race. And, and, and so we're going to use you as like our military, um, you know, our military, our, our proud military boys, they moved them and moved them into like separate living areas. They told them they can only practice certain religion and so on and so forth, right? So they, they policed what you can and cannot do. It's not that there were no agency among Africans, but there's a way that power, you know, the European power actually impacted which ethnic groups, you know, some ethnic groups had uh, fights of succession where the colonialists could come in and be like, okay, well, we're not gonna do this. We're gonna put this person in charge instead and keep it moving. Or, you know, let this line, you know, this family line die off, um, you know, pay off one group and so on and so forth. And so you do have the construction of ethnicity in that way. And that's not to take away from, um, from the fact that people have their own cultural traditions. It's, it's, it's to talk about the reality of conquest where you have a foreign group come in and determine which of your traditions that they will allow to happen and which they won't, which they think is possible, and which they think you know they don't need, which they need to erase so that they have you fighting one another, make you think that you're so different from one another so that they can rule. I mean, that's the perfect example is the Hutu and the Tutsis um, in yeah. Rwanda, where the Belgians yeah. came in and told the Tutsis that they were European based on the hermetic hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, oh, look, like, mind you, these people have been living together and mixing. All of a sudden, it's like, look, Tutsi, you're tall. You got the narrow features of the European. You must be better. Let, let's give you all the better, you know, better jobs within the thing. And, 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 and let's suppress the Hutus. And then the Tutsis believe it, right? And you, yeah. you've constructed a society where you have one group which has been living together with the other for hundreds of years, all of a sudden hate each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And then and then biologize that difference. So all of a sudden, oh, wow, I can tell who, what a Hutu looks looks like when you didn't yeah. before. You know, mm -hmm. so it's just that's what I mean by the construction of ethnicity. But what the kicker is, it's a racializing move. And people don't understand that because people say, well, yeah. you know, ethnic differences, I, you know, I this race that thing. One. <laughs> it was a yeah. bit hard to get you see, because you were saying that. These eth through ethnicization, we are also racializing. And could you then extend that to where you were saying um, Africa is racialized through these ethnicities, but they don't want to talk about race. So, right. yeah, that, because that the idea is people think people. Yeah. Th well, the thing is, people think race is racial conflict, right? So to think about race, you think about black Americans fighting against racism, fighting against apartheid, they think about South Africa, but they don't think about race about as like something that's a process that you're always making, right? So the US constructed race, like I told you earlier that in the US, if you have one drop of black blood, if you have a great, 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 great grandparent that is African, you're black. Mm -hmm. That's constructing race. Yes. In the US, they call Egyptians white because they say European culture begins in Egypt because they claim Egypt for themselves. So they can, so the US racial thing, Middle East, Iran, Egypt, all these things, they are listed as white 
in the US um, racial dynamic, right? So race is constructed. Race was used in the African continent through mm -hmm. African and Asia and Latin America to some extent through ethnicity. And what you do is you go in and, and you if you look at the archives, you'll see how the, the British in particular define native. So they, they first come in and they're like, all these different groups, we're just gonna call them natives. Mm -hmm. And the natives are distinct from the Europeans, mm -hmm. right? So you nativize. So all these mixed people, that's what they did in South Africa. They made them natives. So before they were different groups or whatever, they're like natives, but natives are black and African. And then, so there's a, there's a, a hierarchical order, white, European, and Europeans themselves also become white, right? Because at first they're all fighting each other. You know, Europeans spent hundreds of years fighting each other, yeah. <laughs> right? But colonization gave them whiteness because they're constructing whiteness against blackness, against the Africans and the mm -hmm. other people that they're meeting. So you have that, you have the Europeans and the natives, right? So that's a racial distinction. But within the native group, people mm -hmm. are mixing and so on and so forth. They're like, okay, they're all natives. We're not gonna call them, you know, we, we, we see them all as the same, but we're gonna mm -hmm. give them distinctions based on what we need, right? So we help construct mm -hmm. We have solidified some ethnic groups. We have, we help dissolve some. We bring in cheese when we need. We create cheese, with, and that's what uh, Terence Ranger was talking about. We bring in cheese yeah. when we need cheese to create cheese. So, so the construction of ethnicity is not something that occurred in a natural way. It was something that was pushed along and used and mixed and so on and so forth by the colonialists to deal to to have the effect that they needed. So they had one group fighting against the other and use one group to do one thing and, and, and another. So eat the construction of ethnicity, they were all natives. They nev never on par with the Europeans. So that to me, nativization, constructing all Africans as natives is a racializing move. And even like, so you construct them as all Africans. There might be different Africans here and there, but all Africans have particular sets of cultural attributes that Europeans don't. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't talk about tribes with Europe. You talk about nations. But with Africans, you talk about tribes. Right. You construct names. Right. So mm -hmm. you don't say kings. You say chiefs. Right. Because mm -hmm. diminutive. Right. Mm -hmm. but we, people still talk about tribal this, tribal that. What was Germany and France? I mean, they, you know, in the, the Belgium, these were like tribe people coming together. But even in the naming. Right. You, it's a racializing move because it by saying a group is a nation and another group is a tribe, you're saying tribe is less than, than the nation, right? Because why don't you say Yoruba nation? No, you say Yoruba tribe. Well, that's what's ha okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that nation tribe distinction. You make a, a very interesting point in your book about um, the way Africans don't want to talk, to see themselves as rich, racialized in the global order and they escape to try to tribe or ethnicity as a way of avoiding that conversation so i don't know if you could elaborate on that because it was such a a mind blowing point that i i i couldn't because it explained to me like i was telling you before we started recording why you can hear sometimes Kenyans of an ethnic group talking about Kenyans of another ethnic group in a way that sounds like white supremacy. You know, that group is still stuck in tradition. They are not uh, civilized. They don't like education like us. They don't like business. And yet these are, these are Africans talking about themselves. So how does that happen? Well, I mean, it's you, you got to go back to the Hutus and, 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 and Tutsis, right? We have bought into the stereotypes that were created about us, right? The same way that you have Africans believing that Haitians are only gang members and they're going around killing each other. We have bought into that, right? So you, you, it's been at this point, it's been like 50 years since political independence, quote unquote, yeah. right? <laughs> so you have that, right? These are constructed over time and they solidify and people then end up buying into it. And the same, you still use the same books that the anthropologists wrote about you. Yes. So it's fascinating to me when I'm in Ghana in the bookstore, mm -hmm. what I see is, was it continental? Continental always means European, right? Yes. There's like literature is European. Everything else is marked. 
So the normalization of what Europe is, is we've, we've accepted it, right? So continental food is not African food, even though I'm on the African continent, it's European food, right? It refers to you, classical is European classical. It's not even like local stuff, right? Yeah. And so my thing is, is like you, what you're learning in school is what the anthropologists wrote about the Luo, the Nuer, the Dinka, and they wrote it in the context of extreme racism and seeing Africans as less than. So this notion of civilized, the Luo is less civilized, the Kikuyu is less civilized, so and so so less civilized, comes from the European textbooks that we that we then learn to to believe about other Africans. And I'm mm -hmm. like, if we don't move outside of that, because the truth is, when you leave Kenya, even within Kenya, you see that white people are treated better, lighter mm -hmm. skinned people are treated better. Mm -hmm. Non-black people are treated better in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. There's a hierarchy in the world, no matter how rich you are in Kenya, there's a hierarchy in the world when you travel. You have to ask yourself, why is it? Is there something internally wrong? Because I think the problem is a lot of people believe that there's something internally wrong with them, as opposed to seeing how the world has been constructed in the five, 500 years to uphold Western European white hegemony and keep everyone else down. And so people will buy it because it is white supremacist. When you say this tribe, so-called tribe, because I hate that word, this yeah. so-called ethnic group is, you know, you know, needs more culture, needs more education. It is, it's using the language of race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because the language of race, what it does is, is take these basic differences yes. and make them about like something that's natural and biological so that these differences by the way I look, by the way, I talk then can tell you about my intelligence, about what I can and cannot do. That's what race is. Race is using basic physical appearance and giving it a biological read, right? So these kinds of distinctions are those that have been created over years that then we've bought into because we bought into white supremacist logic of understanding the world, which is why we think white people look better, which is why people bleach Right. This is why we think, you know, we need to straighten our hair and go blonde and all of that stuff, even though blonde and and blue eyes are recessive genes. I mean, that's the reality. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just we bought into it. Um, OK. One of the 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 struggles I had when I was reading uh, your book was um, you were saying that African academics and African intellectuals, they don't want to, to see Africa as racialized. And so they collapse into ethnicity and culture. Just explain that operation, because I sometimes I would feel I've, I've understood it, but then after a while, I don't understand it because um, African intellectuals, at least in Kenya, when we are trying to oppose racism, we oppose it through culture through ethnicity. We don't talk about race. So, um, and we say that that's how we are proud of our African cultures. But when we are saying that, we are talking about specific ethnicities, and yet ethnicities were constructed by colonialism. So what's going on there? That's that's the part I, I was really struggling yeah. with. And I wasn't talking about, yeah, I wasn't talking about African scholars as much as Africanists, which are white people who study oh, Africa. Okay. Right. Yes. And, and so and so okay. that, you know, I mean, I do think some African scholars fall into that as well, because, you know, we're all trained by the same people. Right. You can't publish yeah. if you're part of the. We know there's a hierarchy in African studies because it's white folks who study African, except, you know, that's why there's like the African Studies Association of Africa, which had to be created to to bypass the African Studies Association. So we know this. But I do think there's a way that people don't understand how race works. People think yes. of think of race as mm -hmm racial apartheid, racial friction. So they think of race as something that, like I keep saying, and I know it's hard to understand, they think of race as something only like Hitler, right? Uh, using Nazi, you know, Nazism. They think about apartheid South Africa, right? Where you had the past system and stuff like that. And they think of the US and African-Americans. Yes. And so they see race as always already only race conflict, like this, this fight. And I'm saying race is always made, made and being made. It's made through slavery and a colonial project because it is a colonial project that constructed Africans as so distinct from Europeans like they could never be equal, right? Mm -hmm. But anthropology has had played the, the predominant role in constructing an Africa, 
right? And yes. so without anthropology, there's no Africa as we know it. And without Africa as we know it, there's no anthropology. And the mm -hmm. thing, what anthropology did was saying, well, what's happening in Africa is internal. It's like these tribal, tribal warfares, these tribes, these ethnicity, even to this day. So even though you have IMF, World Bank plans, you have all these World Bank people going in and say, we need to come up with, you know, good governance plan. You know, we need to deal with corruption. We see this as something that's internal to Africa, not linked to a long history of colonization and conquest and yeah. the making of African difference as given, right? Mm -hmm. So the assumption, what's racialized is the fact that from the approach to Africa, Africa's already seen as less than, right? You go into the African continent, there are already assumptions about African culture, African capacity, right? So this I capacity building that you all, you know, people like we all people like to use, you know, the stakeholders, capacity building, all that language. What's capacity building? What does that tell you? That these people don't have the capacity and we have to build it. Mm -hmm. And it's always in reference to Africans. What is it? What's good governance? Right? <laughs> that these people cannot govern. So Ideas about Africans are based on racial assumptions of African inferiority, and people don't want to believe that. So you can say, and so that's race. It's like Europeans constructing this notion of Africans. Saying, Look, people have to think, There's, it's always the same set of stereotypes about Africans. It's like monkeys. So why is it that people in, in Bulgaria will be doing monkey chants? Because everybody has a similar tropes. Of, so we have to wonder where the, this, no matter what you are, what ethnic group you are, everybody has a very similar tropes. They don't make a distinction, right? Mm -hmm. They don't distinguish between the Wolof and the Akan and the Dinka. They see Africa because Africa means a certain thing. And the reason Africa means a certain thing because anthropologists studied Africa as if it was a bunch of tribes that had no central government, that they were behind, that they were, you know, not modernized. This is what whole modernization theory comes from in the 70s, right? Yes. Yeah. That you needed yeah. to modernize Africans. And so you construct Africans as just tribes and culture, which to me is a construction of race, because they're not nations. Nations have governance. They have governments. Africans are like a bunch of people, you know, living in disparate villages, not make taking into account that the reason Africa was like that by the time the Europeans colonized is because the slave trade devastated the continent. Mm -hmm. mm. So uh, does does calling trans, does uh, transferring the 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 term nation to what was previously called ethnicity does that resolve the problem? That's what uh, has happened in Kenya. People have said, oh, because we were tribe, we were called tribes and that's a bad word, we will now use the word nation to describe ethnicity. So does that address the problem? No, it doesn't just because the problem has become structural, right? Because at this point, oh, yes. Right. So at this point, changing the name doesn't change the structure. You know, and, and so, you know, there needs to be a complete dismantle of the world order. I mean, I know that sounds grand, but look, it would not be an equal world because the world order is so unequal. Why is it, for example, that people accept that the UN is a democratic institution when you have five members that are permanent that make all the decisions and these five members, there's no Africans there. They allow the Africans to rotate in on the you know, little security council. The majority of the world can vote something. If, the, if one member of the UN Security Council says no, it won't happen. And the five members are using European, uh, the, the, uh, um, the Security Council is structurally European because the Brits, the French, and the Americans all have the same size, the white side. I mean, all the structures of the world are there to uphold whiteness and white supremacy, the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, ICC, all of that. So, on, but that's based on this 500 years of European control through slavery and colonialism. So until we recognize that, and until we recognize the place of Africans and black people in that world order is at the very bottom, we can't move ahead. And until we don't think through that our own identity, our own education system, the way we teach our kids, the way we read, what we read, because we don't read, you know, people don't even read some of the more radical literature, like Claude Ake, you know, there's a whole radical uh, people writing about social science as imperialism. 
People don't even read that radical African literature from the 70s. They read Europeans writing about Africans and then they take those Europeans, they cite them and then they write and then they, they accept those identities, those identifications. And so the truth is that's where we are. And it's just like, so calling yourself nation, but still believing the idea that this tribe is something that goes back to, from time immemorial is, is a problem. Because then what it does is you don't realize that it's colonialism that actually froze this notion of tribe in place. It did not allow for movement and change and innovation and so on. So in your book, you talk about uh, the ethnicization when you're talking about Ghana and the pitfalls of independence, the ethnicization, the, the, the racialization, racialization and decolonization. What do those terms mean? Well, I think what ends up happening in colonial in de, in the anti-colonial movements that um, so-called ethnic tribal identities get reinforced. So then nationalist movements are fought through ethnic identity as opposed to true nationalist movement, which be, which brings everybody together. And so for true decolonization, it would require deracialization and deracialization not only means like removing the white people from the African continent, which never happened, by the way, they all stayed. <laughs> you know, like, even though you had like the black leaders, these white folks still, you know, kept their land and stuff like that, right, in their positions, right. And so de de deracialization, but deethnicization, which means that trying to drop the 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 um the ethnic identities that were consolidated during through colonialism right so trying to make the borders more malleable and see people as a mix of people or together there's room for change as opposed to like i'm yoruba and i'll be i was always yoruba i'll be forever yoruba right and so then that needed to happen actually for full decolonization because the ethnic identity itself was consolidated in that particular way through the colonial project. And so if you're going to decolonize, you have to actually, you know, decolonize this ethnic identity that was constructed through the colonial project. And I know it's hard, it seems abstract, it's hard to do because we've so we've bought into this these identities. But you know, and if that's not going to be done, then you, you, you haven't decolonized because that ethnic identity itself, not that they weren't, you know, there are always people, you know, they're, they're called, there are things within these identities, but I'm saying they stopped the growth. They, they got frozen through the colonial project. And until we come to terms with that, we're not going to come to terms with a decolonization project. What's and deracialization? Sorry, just go over that again. So deracialization was the fact that the colonial project is a racializing project where the white people are on top and they ran things, right? Mm -hmm. So deracialization was mean removing the white people from power, right? And 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 but Mamdani uses it as like he he thinks deracialization happened, and I'm saying it didn't because the reality is you could remove the white faces from power. But it was still being controlled, you know, from Downing Street, right, in terms of like economic control and so on and so forth. And the other thing is, most of these countries, when they got independence, still had white advisors, right, running things. So, I, you know, from Nkrumah down to everybody, right? And so the white advisors were still there. So that deracialization of the society never really happened because, you know, it was fascinating to me the way that Europeans colonized the African continent. Europe, Europeans should not ever feel too comfortable walking around the African continent. You know, it's fascinating because after everything that Europe has done to Africa, they could still walk around like kings and queens in Africa. They don't need visas to go. Can you go to Europe without a visa? No, right? It's, that's my thing. It's just like deracialization has not happened because white power, the power of whiteness still remains behind, despite the fact that you have black countries. It's still fascinating to me, like, you know, the Notre Dame um, church burnt and you have the Ghanaian president raising money to go build the Notre Dame church when you have, you can't even deal with flooding in Ghana. I mean, no come on. Way. No way. He did that. Um, hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, I guess was what Ngugi would say, right? Decolonizing the mind. You know, hmm. it's like... <laughs> The, the thing is, and, and maybe I don't know whether this is something you're aware of, there's a lot of, 
things which are done in the name of decolonizing, but they are they are reinforced by Europeans. Like I remember there was a conference last year on decolonizing sponsored by the British Council. So what's happening there? That's that that's what I've passed. Yeah, decolonizing would be there would be no British there would be no British Council. That's but real how, decolonizing. How is how are we allowed to call that decolonizing? Right, because, because the British, yeah, it's not decolonization. There should be no British Council, period. I mean, that that would that's what decolon dismantling these colonial orders. There should be no British Council there. Is there a Kenyan Council in Britain? No, there isn't. Okay, let me put it this way. You know, like sometimes we also get regulations, regulations from the UN, from international standards. And it's very hard to raise the question, where did these things come from? And people say we are implementing them because it's part of decolonizing. You know, we Africans, we are proving that we can do just as well as the international community in implementing these international standards. Who's the international community? They say it's all of us because some of us went to the conference. We left Nairobi and went to the conference and we got a visa. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's, let's not mind. The mindset is terrible, but the mindset is, is also terrible because you still wear the wig. Mm, yes, we do. But, but you know, we, 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 we have independence. Well, I, you know, I talk about independence. Seek ye first the, the political <laughs> kingdom and all else will follow. Yes. Obviously, not yeah. all else follows, right? <laughs> you don't have independence because the truth is the fact that the Europeans can come into Kenya without needing a visa, that the fact that yeah. they can do all of that, the fact that the international community we know is not all of us because if the international community had a say, Israel would not still be bombing the heck killing 4,000 kids would not be bombing so many and getting away. The U.S. would not get away with occupying Syria right now. The U.S. Mm -hmm. have military, you know, they, what the U.S. does, they would not get away with that. They would not get away with going into Iraq and killing a million Iraqis. So what's this yeah. international community? What we have to understand is that this world, you know, this world system is structured to uphold white supremacy. And you know, and I would like to suggest a couple of articles by one of my favorite um, philosophers. Um, his name is Siba Grovogi, and he has this book called Sovereigns, Quasi-Sovereigns and Africans. Um, Race yeah, International. I mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you read it, it makes you think because he also has an article called Africa, Come to Africa, Race, a hermeneutics of race and international law. And you realize this notion of international law is actually structured um, to uphold Europe, you know, international law is European law. Or as Walter Rodney, the famous Caribbean um, scholar would say, international law is white law. We've accepted our position at the bottom of the world hierarchy. We've accepted the idea that whiteness is power. And, and we accepted the, 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 the idea that whiteness is good. So Europe can do the most, destructive things and we don't, still don't see them as some you we still see them as having morals this is a problem you called it land uh, learning to to a trained inability a trained inability to see yes. to see how the world is structured because we're we've learned to not see european supremacy white supremacy for what it is and we've learned to blame ourselves for what's yes. going on. The same way that people blame Haitians for what the US has done <laughs> to Haiti over the past 30 years, over the past 150 years. So when you were in Ghana, um, there's a chapter where you're talking about students discussing race. Did you feel that kind of acceptance among in, in that conversation among the students? Uh, that acceptance. acceptance that Europe is good, or what were they grappling with, or they had just well, I, I it was it was interesting because you know the the research was fascinating because if I said I was studying race in Ghana, and this is how I said it began to be like, oh, that's an American, that's an African American yeah. problem, 
So then what I did it was like find ways that people talk about race without really without realizing that they're talking about race, right? So yeah. you know, there so you'd ha- be having a conversation and somebody be like, "Oh, she's fair. She's so nice." You know, well, or because she's, she's light. Right. And you'd have things like Oh, Bruni, which is the word for like stranger, but also it means white. But then, you know, like your 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 nice mango is like a Bruni, you know, the a Bruni mango, right? So what you know, the 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 relationship of whiteness to all that is good oh, is so that. deeply ingrained, right? We learn that in our books from the, from the church. From the fact that you have a white Jesus when Jesus was not white, when you have a white blonde Jesus. I mean, that was the other thing when I was in Ghana. There were like posters of white Jesus everywhere. And and the reality is God does not describe Jesus. I mean, the Bible does not describe Jesus as white. Jesus is not white. If you want to believe the Bible. I mean, but the thing is, you're not believing Ethiopian Christianity. So, you know, whatever. But so there's a link of whiteness to good. White people construct themselves as good. And you go to Europe and you're like, oh, look how beautiful Europe is. Like you go to Belgium and you're like, well, Belgium became that beautiful because they were cutting off the hands of the Congolese. Yeah. You know, if people have the time, go online and watch this film called, was it White King, Red Rubber and Black Blood about what Leopold did to, and it shows you the contrast. As Congo is falling into despair, Belgium is growing and building monuments and so on and so forth. Like Mm -hmm. Europe's wealth is based solely on the exploitation and death of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Europe is a place with the least amount of resources, but it's the richest. We have to ask these questions. Why is it that France has the largest gold reserves when they don't even have a gold mine? Mm. Right. I mean, France is more egregious because they signed these deals. You saw, you heard how they were selling uranium. Did you hear about it yes. in Niger? Of Niger? They were buying it for like at what twenty cents, eighty cents, yes. and selling it at two hundred dollars mm-hmm. per ounce. Yeah. Two hundred euros, and and we accept this as Africans. Like, what's wrong with the leaders? Like, so then you have to be like. <laughs> Part of it, the, there's nothing wrong in ter- It's just we've learned to believe that all of whiteness is good because that's the only way to understand, to not, to not be, to, to not say to yourself, there's something wrong with white morality that allows certain things. Like how does the US get away with so much misery and death? How you can just bomb people, go in and change election results and people don't see you as bad. Look, the US this weekend, had a, like another mass shooting, mm. right? There have been five, more than 500 mass shootings in 2023 in the US. Now imagine if the Western media reported on mass shootings in the US the way they report about the gang problem in Haiti, because there's more deaths in the US than there is in Haiti. What do you do? The images, right? Because what it is, the other problem is we don't control the media. So what do you watch? I know BBC, CNN, maybe Mm. Al Jazeera, but Voice of America. Mm. Mexico is dealing with gang cartels, but Mexico was one of the people that was pushing for armed intervention in Haiti. Why is that? Jamaica has been under a state of emergency for the past two years because of gang problems. A Jamaican gang, you can look this up. Everybody look this up. Burned a whole neighborhood down a couple months ago. But these are the people sending our military intervention to Haiti. <laughs> so what irony. So explain this to me. Israel is bombing the crap out of Gaza. The numbers are not 8,000 dead, 4,000 babies. The UN can't even meet. While this was happening, they met on sending an armed military intervention in Haiti. But don't you think Gaza needs a military intervention to stop the bombing? Why does an internal gang problem that's constructed by the US, by the way, because they, the guns come from the US, the U.S. controls the ports into Haiti. People have to think about these things. Why do we believe it? Why do we believe the media? Because we do, we don't have our own media, also. But also, this you really made a good point about the institutional cultures that we have. With the kinds of institutions we have, they just construct race until it it looks like normal. It makes racism look normal. So 
we can't see it. And when you mention it, at least here, people say, why are you bringing American politics here? We don't have a race problem. Uh, oh, you know, colonialism was bad, but that's in the past. That's what. That's what right. That's but then, and that's, that used to happen to me all the time. And then, the, yeah. but then I would sit there and go into a place like Champs, like I described the all white clubs. That was hilarious. <laughs> in Ghana. Yeah. And, you know, walk into a place and I'm like, wait, I'm in Africa, but this is an all white club you know or things like that you know or being turned away from a nightclub in Ghana with my Ghanaian friends because they wanted to just let it open to just you know Lebanese and white people right and so you ask people then you start asking so well why does this white man get to get go ahead of me in line right why is it that Jesus is white on this billboard you know so then people say oh it's, it's not race but then tell me why white is privileged why is why why is light skin looking better than dark skin? You know, so that's how I had to approach this this question. That's why each chapter is about something else. You know, one chapter is about how how they see white people, because you have these develop I call the development white versus you haven't read that versus yes. the Peace Corps white. Yes, right. Yeah, so the picture and so like you have the the ones in their trucks. You know, IMF, World Bank, and Global Health. All these all these are Western. You know, you know what they are. There are jobs mm -hmm. programs for young white students when they finish high school, I mean, college, because they don't have jobs. So then they're like, oh, I'm going to go work in Africa. You know, and I have a, I, I'll work with an NGO and they're making all kinds of money and they're helping, right? And they drive their fancy trucks and do all of that. That upholds whiteness. Because when they hire local people, they don't pay them the same. They don't pay them in dollars or euros, right? So you know, the NGO culture is what, you know, that's a jobs program for Europeans. That's why they send their kids there. So there's that. But then you have the Peace Corps people who are like going to live in the village and I'm gonna help, you know, bring water. As if Africans who've been living on that continent for <laughs> millennia don't know how to find water and feed themselves. But we've come mm -hmm. to accept that. Right? So so then people are like, oh, this is not about race, but then you sit in a room and you watch the white person be treated better. You watch everybody like wanna, oh, your hair is so pretty, you know, I wanna do that. Oh, you know, I want a mixed race baby. Somebody was just like, yeah, if I can get a mixed race baby, or then look what's happening in Tanzania with the, with these old ugly white women going in there and like, you know, for, for sex tourism with these nice looking young men all over Gambia, all of that. That's race. That's white supremacy. That's, that's, that's privileging whiteness. That's seeing white as better and seeing black as less than. All of that is race. Why do you still have the white highlands? Who lives up there? Oh. I've been to Kenya, but, but, so <laughs> yes, yeah, but you know, but you you said that ethnicity makes us not see race, so it's it's really difficult to talk about race. And and now when I'm hearing you speak, I get the feeling that we are not allowed as Africans to talk about race. So right. I feel that we are so far at the bottom of the hierarchy that even talking about race is not permitted to us. It's not right. allowed. Because you're only allowed to talk about ethnicity because then ethnicity allows you to talk about differences among Africans, African. not differences, not, not the way that white mm. supremacy continues to control the entire continent, politically, culturally, mm. economically, and everything else. Because there is no way for you to think you're equal to white people. If you, there's no Kenya council in Britain, you need a visa and you have to pay hundreds of dollars to get a visa to go there, but then they can come. There's the British Council, there's the German, there's the French, French whatever cultural institute. Where's the Kenya Ken Institute in France, right? Why is it that they don't need a visa? I remember, I remember this, trying to fly from Ghana to Senegal for a conference. And because I had a Haitian passport, they would not let me into Senegal. They told me I had to go to the French embassy in Ghana to get a passport for Senegal. I mean, to get a visa for Senegal. Oh, it's been 2000. So tell me, explain this to me. If this is not about the white intellect, you know, the white political structure of the world, the fact that we are at the bottom and the reason we're at the bottom because it's a racialized global structure. 
And it is about race. It is about race, but race is about power and white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. And so people be like, oh, it's not about that. It's just, you know, we don't have the political power. Well, why don't you have the political power? Mm. Wow. Okay. Um, can we just end on Haiti? Kenya is coming, unfortunately. Uh, the Kenyan people don't want it, but it's got it, the government has ignored us. So is there anything you'd like to tell the Kenyan people or just to, especially the gang story, the gang story has been very difficult to, to refute. So I don't know, because the Kenya media repeats it and the Kenya media repeats it because they get the articles from Western newspapers. So maybe you could just give sort of like, uh, an explanation of uh, why that story is wrong, and yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I it, this is a longer explanation. I, I wanted to. Um, one of the things that people might, must not know is that in two thousand and three, France, Britain, France, and Canada, no, U.S., France, and Canada met in Ottawa, and they decided to remove Haiti's elected, popularly elected president. And they did not like his policies, even though he had given in to some of the, you know, he was the most, you know, after a 30 year dictatorship, he was, he got the most votes, got into power. The US was behind the first coup d'etat. He came back to power. The US is behind the second coup d'etat. So that's, that's President Jean Beton Aristide. So yeah. there's a, if people can look up Ottawa Initiative, so they meet oh. in Ottawa, you can look it up. And then this journalist got wind of it. And in that meeting, they decided they're going to get rid of Aristide and they needed to put Haiti under some kind of international tutelage. This is their language. Right. So by 2004, the 200th anniversary of hate of the of Haitian, Haitian independence, they the U.S. funds a ragtag paramilitary groups that they were sending in the Dominican Republic, sending guns to and training. And and then the U.S. Marines landed in Aristide's house took him and his family and his aides, put them on a plane and flew them to Africa. So you can look at Democracy Now!, February 29, 2003, Democracy Now! is the news media, February, where she's tracing, like he gets a phone and he's calling, he's like, I've been kidnapped. I'm on a plane, I don't know where I'm going, right? So this is, this is the US Special Forces take our president, flies him out. So this is the coup d'etat bun by the US, France, and Canada, which already had troops on the ground in Haiti on, by, the, by the night of the coup d'etat. The next morning, because US, France, and Canada are in a UN Security Council, they call an emergency Security Council meeting and to get the UN to allow a stabilizing mission to go into Haiti. So the UN, so this is, tell, this is these are the gangsters. This is, these are the real gangsters. So the members of the UN Security Council all created a coup d'etat and then use the same members then call the UN and say, there's a problem in Haiti, we need to send an occupation force. And that's exactly what happened. They sent a chapter seven occupation and chapter seven UN occupations are brutal because they allow them to use force against the population. But chapter seven occupations are only for countries at war. Haiti was not at war. There was no civil war. It's a removal of the president. And then once the removal of the president happens, they're protesting the streets. They start calling them gangs. They've always done that. They used to call the protesters bandits and gangs in 1990 during the uh, first occupation from 1915 to 1934. So the word gangs and bandits is a long history of describing what's happening in Haiti. Yeah. So the UN said this thing called the core group. So from 2004 till now, the core group has run Haiti. Brazil led the first military room, what Kenya is trying to do, but Brazil brought was like 7,000 soldiers and Brazil paid for this, right? They occupied Haiti. This military occupation was from 2004 with up to 12,000 military soldiers from all over the world, a whole uh, 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 a civilian you know, uh, group that ran it, and then the core group that made all decisions. The US installed so-called president, ran all elections. So Haiti is under occupation. Whatever happens in Haiti, the UN and the US run Haiti. So if there's a so-called gang problem, it's under the UN occupation because they left. They left most of the military, but the UN office is still in Haiti. And every year they renew the mandate for the UN to control the core group and the UN to control Haiti. So that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. 
The U.S. in particular in 2010, after the earthquake, which killed more than 200,000 people, the earthquake that Pat Robertson says because, you know, of our <laughs> religious practices, right? Yeah. The U.S. forced elections because they decided they were not going to leave it to chance because every time they've had elections, the people pick their favorite. So they removed the most popular party, jean bertrand Aristide's party. They said they, he cannot, they, that party cannot run, right? They have elections. 18% of the people vote. Mind you, this is the earthquake. Still a million people are living in tents. So a lot of people didn't even get a chance to vote. The first round of the elections, the, their favorite candidate did not make the first round. What happens? Hillary Clinton flew to Haiti and demanded that they change the election results. 2011, this is Obama's administration. So every single administration has done this to Haiti, right? They changed the election results and put in, to, put in together, put in place this, this political party and Martelli, PHTK, who the UN just released a report last week that says is one of the biggest funders of young people with arms in the country. I'll send you that report because people need to know this, where the so-called gangs are coming from. So, so ever since then, the US has destroyed the state because they put in this puppet. We haven't had elections. At the beginning of 2004, we had hundreds of, you know, parliamentary senators, local. Now we have zero because there's been no elections. Mm. So this is and so the Haitians have been protesting. So that's the other thing. You can go back to 2018 just do Google search, do Haitian protests 2018 against, you know, the petrodollars because Hugo Chavez of Venezuela had created this program to help Haiti develop by giving it free oil basically to sell and then use the money. That same government that the U.S. put in place stole billions of dollars. People were on the, on, on the, um, on the streets protesting. The U.N. brought cholera that killed 30,000 Haitians. You know, I know people talk about Palestine, the spectacular violence, like 8,000, but mm -hmm. the U.N. dumped feces in the main water stream of Haiti that people use to wash, to cook, right? Gave the population cholera, which sickened more than a million people and killed 30,000 people. That did not even make the news. And the UN did not accept responsibility for six years. Till this day, you can look it up, UN cholera Haiti. Till this day, they haven't given reparations, they haven't fixed the water system or anything, right? So Haitians can die by the thousands and the world will not blink. This is all under occupation, right? The UN occupier. So there's that, that happens, there's the cholera, there's the rapes, the UN's running sex rings, you can look that up in Haiti. So this party that's in place, the US is trying to hold, uphold. And to, so there are all these protests, the US, the Haitians are like, these people are not our representatives, we want them out of power. 2020, 2019, the replacement is another puppet that's handpicked, Jovenel Moise. There are tons of protests, and in the protest, people are like, the U.S., leave us alone. Stop interfering. So you can go yeah. to Google, look up all these protests, stop interfering in, you know, the U.S., U.N., the core group, get out of Haiti. This is 2020. The president gets assassinated by Colombians. And we know the U.S. knows about this because the U.S. has all the evidence and they're the ones doing the trial. And I don't know what the jurisdiction is, how the U.S. can, the U.S. FBI can go to Haiti, take all the evidence and then take it back. But yeah. Right. Ever since then, the so people are protesting against Moise. The core group picks who their prime minister is. The Haitians had no say in the prime minister. The core group, the UN office in Haiti, sent a tweet out and a communique that says so and so will be the prime minister. So when people say the Haitian government asked Kenya to help, there's no Haitian government. The people that are asking are puppets that are brought in what? to do that. There is no Haitian government. Look up Aria Henri was, he's a, the prime, we don't have a president, which has been assassinated. Mm -hmm. so, so then the US has been wanting to find a way because they want him in power because one thing he did that the other governments could not do, you can look up IMF protest Haiti. They, the IMF forced, wanted to force Haiti to remove fuel subsidies, which raised fuel prices by 40% overnight. So all summer 2019, 2020, Haitians were protesting against this IMF thing. Mm. And then with this prime minister, he said he was going to do it. So there are protests against him. And you know what he said? Oh, these are gangs. They're not really protests. If you look at these pictures, they're like hundreds of thousands of people in the streets protesting, right? So we think what happened is 
the U.S. has been trying since 2021, the summer, to send this military force because they want to keep this puppet in power. He's only in power. He's surrounded by U.S. special forces. That's the only way he's in power. No, but he's not elected. And so they want, but they also want to keep Haiti because you have to wonder, you have to wonder why is the U.S. so interested in Haiti? Yeah. This that's little wondering. country, yeah. these black people, why? But then you have to ask yourself, why does the U.S. has the fourth largest embassy in Haiti? The, U, the fourth largest embassy in the world, U.S. embassy in the world is in Haiti. There's oil in Haiti, there's gold in Haiti, but they also need Haiti's position so that they can fight against Venezuela. They want, they've been wanting this bay called Mont Saint Nicolas in the northern part of Haiti, right under Cuba, which is an yeah. easy way for boats to go to get to the Panama Canal so that when they go to war with China, it's easier to get to the, to get to the Pacific coast, to get to the Pacific. This is the 10th occupation in 30 years. This is the 10th in invasion in 30 years. Hmm. But this time they don't want to make it seem like it's another white country because it's not so they get they want a black face to control the resources and access to the things. That's hmm. what's been happening. And but the gang thing is is real in the sense that rich people have always used poor. Let's let's ask Kenyans this. When you look at these guys, they're walking around in flip flops, challenge, you know, flip flops, ragtag clothes, but then they have these guns that are like ten thousand dollars. Sophisticated, yeah. Where did they get the guns? Where did they get the ammunition? They didn't make them. The guns yeah. are imported from the U.S. The U.N. reports that all the guns come directly from the U.S. The five ports in Haiti are owned by private families who stand to gain, right? So this is really what's going on. What's going on in Haiti is a colonial situation. We're fighting against U.S. colonialism. And to me, Kenyans have to ask, well, why is it that Kenya never had diplomatic relations with Haiti until a few weeks ago? Because the Chinese and Russian governments were, they blocked this, by the way, they've been blocking it for two years and they finally relented because there's so many black countries saying we're gonna do it, right? So then you have to, yes, they blocked it. They've been blocking this resolution for two years, right? Cause they're like, this, this is no mission. And then the other thing is if there's, if there's a, a, a situation, Haiti's not at war. The other thing is the whole gang thing is yeah. in Port-au-Prince. Haiti is a country of 12 million people. It's huge. The gang thing is in Port-au-Prince. One of the biggest gangs is right next to the U.S. Embassy. So we know who funds this, right? The other thing is the prime minister that the U.S. is holding up is implicated in the murder of the Haitian president, right? He refuses to go before the judge that keeps calling it. So this is the mess that Kenya is coming into. And so we have to know this conversation about gangs is the way the U.S. can manipulate the media, right? Because mm. if you're only watching CNN, BBC, mm. and then even Boy. local news is taking your stories. Like when I go to Africa and I open the newspaper, you can look at the top from BBC, from Voice Boy. of America. Because what, are there Kenyan reporters in Haiti to really know what's going on? Do they speak Haitian Creole? Why are you taking the word of the white man? And you know, Malcolm X has the saying that said that the Western newspapers will have you believe that the victims are the oppressors and the oppressors are the victims. Yeah. We have to remember that. So you cannot think about the way that the US represent Africans in images and, and think about the way that they will represent Haiti to get what they need. And I hope we sit back and ask ourselves, why is it this tiny little country is getting so much attention from the West? What is it that the US needs? And why would we want to play this part of a comprador of this, of this black face to cover US imperialism and oppress Haiti some more? Haitian people don't want intervention. The other thing is, ask yourself, why is it the only solution you have for Haiti is a violent one? Because mm -hmm. the U.S. could actually stop. They know where the guns are coming from. They could they could put an embargo, which is what the Russian and Chinese government said. We need to stop the guns from coming in. Because once people don't have ammunition, it's a bunch of ragtag young men. All you need is to cut off ammunition in the guns. So why is it that we need? Look, after the earthquake, the May first thing the U.S. did was build a prison. So because when they see black people, they think the only solution we need is like, you know, prison. Or force. Or, Why or, is it that we need force? Why is it that the only solution is a forceful one, where you have foreigners coming in pointing guns at at people? Mm. It's 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 really it's distressing. And as a Haitian, speaking on behalf of our people, we don't need another intervention of foreigners killing our people.
Mm -hmm. We need the US and the UN, the core group, to get out of Haiti and leave us alone. Stop interfering. Mm -hmm. The UN, the UN, Haiti has been under occupation since 2004. We need to end this occupation so that we can live our lives and, and, and live our free, proud history the way we should. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Thank you so, so much. You've been such a good resource. Uh, I hope uh, Kenyans will benefit from the insights that you have given us. And I will share a lot of your links so that uh, if Kenyans want to know more, they can just follow them up. So I want to say thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wanja. I'm so grateful that you gave me this opportunity to really talk about Haiti and, and my work. I hope, hopefully we'll stay in touch. This was so wonderful. Thank you. And you had great questions. I've never had such nice probing questions, so I appreciate that. <laughs>